Hello everyone <coughs> and welcome. Uh, I am Behruz Tamari Tabrizi. You're going to get sick and tired of me introducing myself by the end of this semester. Uh, uh, I'm the director of uh, Sharmin and Bijan Musawar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. Um, <coughs> today I have the uh, pleasure of uh, introducing uh, my good friend uh, and uh, one of our uh, brilliant scholars of uh, modern and medieval Iran, uh, Professor Babak Rahimi, uh, who is a uh, professor of um, uh, many hats, you yes. know, at the University of California in uh, San Diego. Um, uh, Professor Rahimi, it's a, a bit awkward for me to call you Professor Rahimi, but I'm going to wow. call you Professor Rahimi uh, with your permission. Um, uh, got his PhD uh, from uh, <coughs> the European University uh, Institute in uh, Florence uh, in Italy. A lot of good food there. Um, his uh, first book uh, came out in 2011. Uh, uh, theater State and the Formation of the Early Modern Public Sphere in Iran, Studies on Safavid Muharram Rituals from 1590 to 1641. Uh, so that's the reason I said that scholar of contemporary modern Iran and, and medieval Persian history. <coughs> and the book is uh, focused uh, on relationship between state building, urban space, and uh, ritual culture. Uh, Professor Rahimi is also the co-editor of uh, Social Media in Iran, which came out in 2015, and the co-editor uh, uh, of uh, the uh, widely anticipated, the Wiley Blackwell History of Islam, came out in 2018, uh, and Muslim Pilgrimage in the Modern World, uh, also co-edited with uh, Peyman Ishaqi uh, that came out uh, a couple of years ago in uh, 2019. <coughs> His articles have been uh, uh, appeared in uh, Thesis 11, International Political Science Review, International Communication Gazette, International Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, among others, uh, a prolific writer. His research interests concern the relationship between culture religion and uh, technology. Uh, and uh, the talk today is based on his uh, forthcoming book, Senses of Mourning, Shi'i uh, Muharram Performances in Iran from 1864 to 2020. Uh, and uh, without further ado, please help me to welcome Professor Babak Thank you, Behuzan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, Bezan, thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I think I'm going to echo what everyone also already thinks, that we highly admire you. We admire you as a scholar and also as a friend. Hopefully I'm not putting too much watermelon under your bagal, but it is, it is coming from a good place, and I, I want to thank you. And I want to thank you, the, the Center for organizing all these wonderful talks uh, which I've been enjoying watching them online. It's been a fascinating educational experience. My humble contribution to the lecture series, hopefully, will be on the idea of Iran as really a, a, a contentious idea, but also want to go hopefully beyond it and look at the idea and the very practice of modernity itself. And hopefully I could do that in the short time that I have, but I will do my best to do it. Uh, before I, I introduce today's talk, um, I do want to acknowledge few people, uh, and I want to do this because a lot of pictures here and people have helped me with in various ways in, in putting these pictures together. Uh, first and foremost, uh, my good friend Eskander Sadeq Burujerdi, Vali um, Mahluji, uh, Jane Lewison, Ali Reza Qasim Khan, who actually uh, helped me find this one photo from um, Shiraz Art Festival, and Muslim Nad Ali Zadeh. I also want to thank or acknowledge Manoto for providing some of the pictures that you're going to be seeing in this presentation. Uh, this is, I hope is in public domain, but I know they're losing 18 million pounds a year. 
So I just thought, hey, you know, they might be actually coming after me to, you know, to get money. They're not going to find much. They might, they might end up suing me for showing some of the pictures. So I do want to acknowledge, I have witnesses here, that many of the pictures I will show here, they will, it would have the Manitou logo on it. So hopefully everything will be okay. <laughs> yes, oh, I, we, could, we could have another talk about Manitou. But um, this presentation is going to be ba um, basically a fragment of a chapter, chapter two of a book that hopefully will come out next year. Inshallah, we'll see when that book is going to come out. Senses of Mourning, Shah Muharram Performances in Iran. It, it starts with Takiyah Dolat, the construction of Takiyah Dolat, which I think I have a picture here, and it ends with the pandemic. It looks at the five senses. Each chapter looks at one particular sense, beginning with listening, audio, and it goes through all the senses and looks at the Iranian history through Shia Muharram performances through the senses. So it's a sensorial uh, idea of nation, nation building, and he looks at the rituals as a site wherein Iran continues to be constructed, ending with, of course, eating Nazriya. So this is what really the book is. Now, in this particular chapter that I'm uh, talking about, but I'll, I'll be moving around. That's the only way I could do things. And that's because um, I'll explain why I will do that. But what I'm really looking at in this picture or this chapter is what I understand to be the oculocentric aspects of the late Pahlavi modernization. I do fundamentally still, I believe, that modernity, the project of modernity, is fundamentally tied to oculocentric imaginary, and I think the Pahlavi modernization very much participated in that and continued all the way till 1979. The theatricalization of Tazia is part of that oculocentricity. The way in which Tazia moved from an audiosonic performance into a more visualistic, theatrical, spectacle performance. And I kind of outline how historically that was done and the ideology that went into making that possible. Of course, the focus is going to be on the Festival of Arts. This is the first time that Tazia was actually publicly staged. It was also the first time that was televised. This is fascinating. And hopefully, if I have time, I'll talk about the aspect of TV at the end of my talk, if I have enough time. The main point is that a particular kind of ideology developed during this time in which the old somehow became the new. The old became spiritual. The old became a site of a new modernity, thanks to Fari, uh, Farah, who was very much played an important role in this uh, particular festival. So uh, as someone who's a big admirer of Walter Benjamin, an idea of a storyteller. I do want to make this hopefully into a kind of a performance. We all do performances of various kinds. I do like to see this presentation in three acts. And hopefully, I'm not going to do naqali. I'm not going to do that. That's a massive uh, job to do. But I will try my best to kind of give you different uh, performances in which Tazia develop into a theatrical kind of an art form. Uh, Tazia. A history will be the first act, Tazia and ancient spirits in the Festival of Arts will be the second. And finally, if you have some time, I will talk about the kind of a theoretical dimension of this uh, theatricalization of Tazia. Act one. Let's begin with history. And with that history, we have to talk about what Tazia means. Well, at least the way I understand it. So when we talk about Tazia, Shabi Khani, sometimes also called. We normally refer to a set of dramatic art performances observed in the morning of Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, and the third Imam of Shia uh, Muslims, who died a martyr's death at the battlefield of Karbala in 680. However, historically, the term tazia has had a broad meaning. So tazia, we think, is just a performance, but it actually really means mourning, mourning of various different kinds of you know, tragic events. You know, Nasser al-Din Shah's death was also called, the performance for it was also called Tazia for the Shah. So Tazia has a kind of a broad meaning. Its root term, Aza, really refers to a body of mourning performances with a long tradition that goes back to Mesopotamian Iranian landmass, the civilizations that existed uh, in antiquity. So, for instance, in um, the 16th century martyrology of Hussein Waiz Kashafi, Rosat al-Shohada, the term uh, taziyat is number of times is referred to, and is very much in reference to mourning 
for uh, Imam Hussein in the act of devotion and love for the martyred Imam. However, Tazia at this time was not a, a, a performance. It did not exist as far as I know and as far as my research shows. So you could see Tazia has a kind of a broad meaning. However, recently, of course, for the last 100 years, or actually 200 years, it has had a specific understanding of it into an art form. Now, what's my understanding of Tazia? A distinct ritual or performance within a larger Muharram body performances. So Muharram has a large body of performances, and Tazia is just one of them. And it's first and foremost, it engages in devotional practices oriented in what Charles Hirschkin calls the spiritual listening that tunes the ear to the divine sound. I cannot tell you how many times the word listening keeps popping up in Tazia episodes. What's also interesting is that if you have ever gone to a Tazia performance, you could literally close your eyes and listen to the entire performance while watching it in your mind's eye because visuality is not central to Tazia. It is the sonic performance because the audience, the so-called audience, already knows the story. They already know the story. It's very much like a, within the, you know, one could actually compare to the, the ancient Greek performances, but uh, that's going to be another topic in itself. So for understanding Tazia, I would urge us to pay attention to the audio, audio sonic performing repertoire with a long history in Islamic homiletic traditions within which stylization of speech in connection with body gestures enacts an ethical practice being in the world. The ethical aspect is going to be important. So I define Tazia as a constellation of practices. In fact, I use the word technologies of self, self-awareness, knowledge, built around sonic performances. The ideal in a Tazia performance and the people who participate as audience and performers is to mourn a truth, to tell a truth through mourning enacted and relived in everyday life. Uh, it's interesting to note that Tazia really doesn't have a stage. I know people think Saku is the stage for Tazia. Actually, it doesn't. You could do Tazia anywhere because it's supposed to be embedded in everyday life. So, what are we looking at here? We are looking at the history of Tazia beginning with uh, Cholokovsky's proposal, and I agree with it. It somehow has its genesis in Rozakhani. And Rosa Khani is really based on a number of different martyrological texts. This one is the most famous one. We're looking at late Taimuri period, early Safavids. What the Safavids did is that, for various reasons, they institutionalized this devotional practice into a lived urban religion. And I do fundamentally argue what the Safavid did, what, the reason why the Safavids uh, initiated a revolution, it was fundamentally about urban building. Naqsh Jahan itself is the most incredible, incredible architectural site that was supposed to be, here we go, an act of state making. In fact, what I argue from a performative perspective that you know, we should be careful not to confuse regime with states. Regime are a group of people who do govern, whereas a state is actually a performating, performative act in which the state makes itself possible and visible. I could talk about state formations of a performative type from the early modern to the present time. We don't have time. But this distinct and important development with Naqsh Jahan had Muharram rituals in the middle of it. I connect Muharram performances with the creation of a new proto-public, a Perso-Shia Iranian collective identity that is really, I argue, the genesis of the Iranian, eventually Iranian nation state in the 19th century. I'm not originally saying that. I actually borrowed this from Catherine Babayan, whose book I very much, this was my Bible in graduate uh, school, by the way. And also Susanna Babayi, another fascinating Safavid historian. Um, I'm hearing some people are arguing that the Iranian identity goes back, the modern identity goes back to the Sasani period. And apparently some people are actually making the argument they're making this talk in Paris. I would say that's actually so false, but more importantly, that's reflecting a kind of a nationalistic ideology, which this book wants to challenge implicitly. Am I being controversial? Yes, that's the point. That's what we do academia. We're supposed to debate these things. And I'm happy to argue that, in fact, whoever has said that prior to 18th century, Tazia existed, they don't know much about Tazia, or they are probably doing an ideological readings of Tazia. What the, the fact is that, we really don't have much evidence, quote unquote, about Tazia prior to the German Danish cartographer's travel accounts 
from 1765, where he uh, gives an account of what we understand to be as Tazi, a dramatic performance with dialogue, prose, and poetry. We don't have a prior to 1765. We do have some noskhe. These are basically scripts that a Tazia Khan would read, and there's a whole philosophy behind it. We have some, and the dating is a bit controversial, but we're guessing we're looking at probably 1740s, 1750s. But prior to that, my good friends, we don't have any actual evidence. What we do know, though, thanks to the work of uh, Lucy Deacon, is that uh, most likely Tazia developed either late Safavid period or post-Safavid period in the villages. And she relies on this very interesting account, the Ajar court account, that argues that, in fact, the origins of Tazia go to the villages. Now, Cholokovsky has a, a very famous argument that, in fact, originated in urban uh, areas. Uh, whatever the case is, I'm, I'm somewhere in between, by the way. I think both of them. I don't think we should divide up the village for the city. In a, uh, and then itself is a modernist assumption. The villages and the cities were very much in symbiosis, especially in this period of time. Well, we do know, though, in the 19th century, uh, Tazia just exploded. Thanks to Ajar patronage, uh, also the guilds, the merchants, they're, they're funding Tazia, they're having takia. We have a whole moral economy of takia building. But what's also interesting is that, uh, here we go, here we go. Please make a note of this. The ulama were supportive of, ta of Tazia. How did this whole idea, and you find this in Roy Mutahed's book, you find it everywhere. The, the Mujtahids, the ulama were against, no, that's actually coming from Gobino. It's actually coming from Gobino. You'd be surprised how much of our knowledge of Tazie goes back to Gobino, the famous orientalist, racist French author, who I'm gonna actually talk about later on. Well, what's important with Takie is that it developed into this massive architectural, so I love this, I'm writing a, a, a short book on this with a friend of mine and um, oh gosh this is I told you I'm going to do harsh here or I'm going to stop myself time is limited then itself was really the time when we see visualization participating in this sonic performative tradition this is when um, a, a modern technology but also modern conceptions of depictions like Kamal uh, um, depiction of uh, Taki Dolat is now making a, a presence in the Nasseri period. Make a note of this. This is fast. This is not a realist painting. Does anyone know what's going on in this painting of uh, the famous one? Whenever you see uh, Taki Dolat, there is movement. There are a bunch of things happening at once in this painting. It's a, literally a movie depicted in one pictorial site. And please uh, tell my good professor, Professor Abbas Amanat. There is no evidence that Takya Dolad was inspired, quote unquote, by Royal Albert Hall. That's absolutely false, given the fact that Nasir Dinsha traveled to England in 1873. And of course, Takya Dolad, the construction started in 1864. There's an argument he saw a picture of perhaps the Royal Ab No, it just doesn't make sense. The fact is that new research is showing us. Uh, <clears throat> This is Qasim Khan's uh, very interesting book. That in fact, there is a very, quote unquote, boomy or native architectural tradition that is building Takya Dolat. And it's just something that we need to continue to do our research. But what we do know, though, is that despite its popularity in the Nasser period, after the death, death, uh, death assassination of Nasser Din Shah, uh, Tazia somewhat declines, but it was really because of Reza Shah that Tazia kind of declines in the cities, not in outside of the cities, not in rural areas. Um, the ban of Tazia by Reza Shah is fascinating given the fact that he declared the end of Tazia in Takiyah Dolat. It's called the Tazia Qajar. The, the last Tazia in Takiyah Dolat was actually a Tazia for the Qajar dynasty, and it was done by Reza Shah, so that's a performative element. But Reza Shah definitely uh, um, made that happen. Make a note here, I said 1930s. We don't actually know exactly when it happened, 1932, 1933. But um, um, uh, Taqiyah Bahar, Muhammad Taqiyah Bahar, the famous poet, says that it was done gradually, step by step. And there's a whole politics behind why Reza Shah did that. I just gave you a background to Tazir and how he ended, well, somewhat. And now we're about to have act two of this performance. And this act two wants to say this. From 1920 to 1945, 
literally silence. <laughs> Two decades of suhud or silence. You know, you know, you guys know what I'm talking about here. No reference to Tazi. There's one documentary that shows bit of a taki dolat before it's destroyed, but not much in academia, scholarly, any kind of works that we know from that area. I haven't found any. If you do, please let me know. But something incredible happens for those people who are nerdy about Tazia studies, and that was the publication of this article by Abul Hussein and Nusheen, the famous playwright and playwriter. This is the guy that basically brought European style theater to Iran. And, and industrialize it to a certain point. And he's writing an article in this very interesting journal called Hollywood. Interesting. And here is basically referring to Tazi for the first time as heritage, miras. This is the first time Tazi is being framed in that way. Now bear in mind, this is of course right around the, the, uh, the post-occupation Iran. Allies are about to leave out of effort. I have to look up actually the exact date with the Journal was published, particular article was published. But somehow from 1945 to 1959, a bunch of things are happening. People are publishing thesis papers on Tazi and comparing it to the Christian passion plays in Colombia. And the interesting things are happening. Uh, the most interesting, of course, was Parvi Sayyad's um, 1959 uh, staging of fragments of Tazi in Sangelaj theater, this uh, theater is still active. It's one of the most brilliant theater spaces that um, we really need to do some research because uh, it's just fascinating. But Paris Hayat, it's breaking grounds. Oh my God, Tazia is now becoming public. Um, the Shah monarchy is you know, somewhat ambivalent about it, but nevertheless, they're letting that happen. Of course, the next time when Tazia is actually put on a public display in an urban setting, uh, actually, it wasn't done in this urban setting, it was in the stadium, it was in the uh, Festival of Arts in Shiraz. I'll come back to that in the third act, or was it later on in the second act? I forget. Um, but what's important with the whole history of Tazia in the festival is fascinating. Uh, Paris Sayat, a rising, uh, I wouldn't call him playwright, let's just call him a, 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 a theater director, an actor. He's staging this massive Tazia here. This place is filled with people. And now the TV, which was established in 1967, is recording it. And Tazia is now becoming known to Iranians who at that age have never seen Tazia before. Isn't that interesting? Including uh, Muhammad Qafari, who will later come to play and actually direct Tazia later in the festivals. It's alive, like a Frankenstein story. My god, Tazia is living. No, they were smoking a lot of weed, I'm sure, because in reality, Tazia very much was alive outside of the cities. But in the cities, and this is the modern construct, people weren't aware of Tazia. They're like these new generation of Iranians are looking at Tazia, especially students. They're finding it fascinating. Newspapers are writing about it. Then comes the 1970 uh, um, second staging of Tazia in the festivals. Uh, by the way, if you notice, Manoto, just okay, Manoto, I did acknowledge you. Uh, again, Pavi Sayyad is added. He makes another one, this one, as a Hosseinia, which is very interesting. He's moving towards a more traditional setting of Tazia. There's a bit of an intermission. I'll tell, I'm going to share gossip with you about that, why that happened. And then in 1976, boom, seven Tazias in seven days. Muhammad Qafari is breaking grounds. It's happening again in Husseinia, uh, a moshir in Shiraz and a village outside of Shiraz. Fascinating. People are visiting it. People who have never seen Tazia before, mostly students. They're getting inspired by it. And there's another sideshow. Oh my God, this was huge. This is how I actually discovered Tazia. I, as growing up in Iran, I never saw Tazia myself. That's because I actually lived in Kurdistan. My father was stationed there. So given the fact it was a Sunni, uh, populated province. I just never saw Tazir growing up. It was really that's how I actually got to know my Tazir was through this book. Cholokovsky, my great, I, I have the highest admiration for Peter Cholokovsky for doing that. For this, uh, he led and chaired a symposium which included another, a number of major figures, including William Beeman and um, you know, Professor Yashar Ter. In this Edit a volume, which continues to be really the basis of Tazia Shanasi or Tazia studies. Peter Cholkovsky says this, Indig Tazia, indigenous avant-garde theater of Iran. So this symposium is happening while the performances are also happening, mostly at night. 
This title is deliberately controversial. Oh yeah. But it is perhaps the most accurate description of the only indigenous drama engendered by the world of Islam. Islam does not have any dramatic performances. The Tazia of Iran is ritual theater. Look at the way this term is combined, these two terms, and draws it from its content from deep-rooted religious tradition, so we can't forget about the religion part, but although it is Islamic in appearance, and that's going to be, this is what I do in my classes, I have to, you have to read every sentence in any word. It is a strongly Persian. I don't know what makes it weaker Islamic and what makes it stronger Persian. We'll get to that, my good friends. Drawing vital inspiration from its special political and cultural heritage. I'm not going to read the rest because we are about to do a Goris. Well, not yet. Actually, I have, I'm going to ask you this question. How did Tazi become an indigenous theater and strongly Persian? How did it happen from 1945, suddenly just being a miras or, or heritage, suddenly becoming uh, strongly Persian, and this is where the Goris happens. For those who know Tazia, Tazia has a tendency to do side stories, and I'm going to do a side story, but it's going to come back to the main story. My good friends, I need to take you, in order to elaborate on what Shalakovsky is talking about here, I need to go do a Goris to somewhere that you would not think of. Does anyone know where I'm going to take you? Birmingham. The Midland Institute, where I want to go, hopefully soon. This is just to research. This is the place where the famous medieval moralist, poet, critic, Matthew Arnold, who's already famous in the Victorian poetry called, uh, scene, is writing one of his, or actually lecturing in one of his famous lectures on Tazi. Or actually, there's only one lecture on Tazi, but he's giving a bunch of other lectures. But this lecture particularly became super famous in the Victorian time. It actually got responses and our Time magazine, Time journal, um, newspaper articles about Tazia. People are discussing it. And of course, this had a lot to do with the craze at the time of the Persian, Rabayat Khayyam, you know, all of that, which I could talk about for hours. It's fascinating. But what we get with this lecture is this explicit reference of Tazia as a form or, or comparison to uh, the Christian passion place. And remember, as a medievalist, the medievalist Victorians were fascinated by how medieval Christianity had this pure, beautiful era in which we could, as a moral, uh, uh, kind of a model we could use to, in order to fight or, or counter industrialization. Um, Matthew Arnold would, and I'm not going to read this, I don't have time, but he would argue this. Uh, that really ultimately Tazie is for the Persians, and the word Persian is extremely important, is a feeling of patriotism. And it is a way of resisting the conquering Semitic Arabians, which of course Islam is associated with. And he goes on, keeps in talking about, of course, the element of patriotism. That does that ring your bell here already. And of course, he's making reference to some very famous dude who many in Victorian times are already reading, some of them in French. I think the book was already translated. Oh, yes, Monsieur Gobineau. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. This guy broke grounds in race scientific theory. I wouldn't even call it science. It's pseudoscience. But nevertheless, this guy's book was huge. It had a huge impact uh, in relations to Wagnerism, uh, Chamberlain, uh, and, of course, the race theory that developed in late 19th century. We don't have time for, for, for us to talk and explore this. But what I do want to say is uh, Gobina, who actually was in Iran, traveled to Iran, and he admired Iranian culture. Uh, uh, and he was not happy with the decay of the Aryan race, is the way he understood it. He thought Tazi was great because it was really an expression of the Aryan race. I'm, sum I'm summarizing things. What's also interesting is that he constantly compares it to Greek theater. Because remember, for these 19th century people, theater was the height of civilization. A view that cont we continue to have to this day, by the way. Theater was really ultimately a great uh, civilizational expression. And of course, was Tazi doing that? But he was doing it because Persians hate the Arabs. And given the fact Arabs were Semites, barbaric, this is how Iranians managed to survive their identity, through doing something theatrical, which is really a reflection of the high culture of the Aryan race. Oh my god. It's fascinating how many times people ref reference Gobine in my field, and they never bring up the racial aspect, except one scholar based in Cambridge, a young scholar who's doing that. I'm so happy that she's doing it. We know famously the whole Aryan race theory, thanks to uh, Reza um, uh, Ziad Rahimi's book and other books of school and works. 
how much the Iranian race theory got into the late Qajar intellectual discourses. Of course, Kermani is, is the one that actually used the word Aryan or Arya into a racial category. Uh, Pierre, Pierre Nia's famous Tariq Iran, which is read even to this day, is it, something that actually was incorporated within the early Pahlavi educational system. Um, what happened is that after the Constitutional Revolution, which in itself was fascinating, the way Tazi was performed in Constitutional Revolution, that in itself, oh gosh, we don't have much time. Um, we are looking at really the dark years of Tazi. Tazi is not discussed mostly because Farhang or culture is being eradicated, well, not, is being reconstructed completely in terms of preserving culture, but in a way that Islam is not very much part of it. Now, um, Tani's very interesting about Aryanization of the Persian revival uh, is looking at that period in which Aryanization is taking over all across Iran. I think I mispronounced the author's name. Tazia uh, uh, Mavin is in Shiraz, these are my own photos, and you could find how even a Tazia space is being Aryanized thanks to that generational effort to reconstruct Iranian identity. This first generation of folklorist historians, they are not interested in Tazi or any kind of a religious tradition. They want to do away with Islam. Uh, this is the first generation after the Constitutional Revolution. The second generation, however, has a different look. Uh, this is not a monolithic group of people. Some of them are admiring, in fact, Tazi, especially Khojaste Kia. I didn't realize what a role she played in the whole process. They thought Bahar is another important person. But they're looking at Tazi exactly how Gobino perhaps was looking at it. And it had a lot to do with understanding Tazia as a disguised religious or, or cultural artifact in which Iranians have maintained their identity. I'm going to skip through these just to let you know there are a bunch of different intellectual groups in the second generation. So I just want to, don't want to reduce everything um, to this, this group I just mentioned. Uh, there's a discursive network here. The people are reading their stuff, each other's works. Um, but this second generation is fascinated by dreams by myth, by rituals. Khojastikia is a good example of it. And of course, the myth of Siyavash. How many books were published on Siyavash and the myth of Siyavash during this time? Stories, narratives, articles is just mind boggling. It is also the kind of legend that pops up in Bahram Beyza's famous book, another classic that is still being read in Iran, outside of Iran, for the way theater and performance is being narrated within the broader Iranian historical narrative. This is also where we get explicitly someone like Beizai talking about Tazia as a religious cover, Sarfushe Mashabi, uh, for ultimately Iranians fighting against Arab, Arab religion. But also interesting in the Beizai's book, page 15, is actually the Aryan migration or invasion theory, which we know um, the Orientalist roots of it. Now, Cholokovsky's edited volume comes uh, within the festival and within that ideology, quite frankly. Uh, and of course, much of this, uh, one could also credit the myth of Siyavash to Professor Yoshate's very influential short chapter, which at the end refers to Tazia with deep roots in the Persian soul. By the way, the Persian soul is a very much of a 19th century Orientalist trope that Ernest Renan actually used as well. What am I saying here? I'm getting almost already myself into a lot of trouble. But what we do know is that Professor Cholkovsky, again, who I highly admire, did make a reference to Tazia as part of the Aryan heritage. As you could see, the Aryan race theory, implicitly and explicitly, was very much there in the way in which Tazia was incorporated to the, um, how much time do we have? Oh my god, five more minutes. I'm going to make this short. Um, five more minutes, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to read this, but basically what Parvi Sayyad is saying is, look, when we did Tazia in Shiraz, we actually had to downplay its religious side and bring up the aesthetic parts because ultimately we have to show the Westerners that, look, we have theater. We are just like you guys. Of course, what he would have just said is that we are white and we love being white. But also what Parvi Sayyad is doing, something really weird, he's taking away the word Tazia and it's replacing it with Shabi Khani. And he's saying Shabi Khani actually has a Persian root. This is, to me, completely Gobino in a very somewhat, not sophisticated, but modern uh, way of, of explaining it, modern in contrast to the 19th century version of it. Shiism as a disguise for Iran is a theme that continues to haunt us to this day. People comparing 
uh, Iran's love for Ali as a replacement for Rostam. I've heard this from scholars who work in the field. It's just mind-boggling. So my question is this. In five minutes, what's the implication of viewing Tazia as a national Iranian art form while downplaying its religious tradition? And this is where we enter Act 3, but unfortunately, as, as Mark Aurelius famously wrote at the end of his meditations, I just have to cut out my last you know, meditation. It's like, you know, it's like, life is too short, and unfortunately, my life of this performance is too short, and we have to probably get away to the Q&A, but I do want to emphasize this, that what we are looking at the reconstruction of Tazir, thanks to the way in which it was reimagined as an Aryan tradition, had a lot to do with the way in which a, a distinct form of modernism as part of the modernization process of late Pahlavi emerged in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And this is what I call a traditionalist modernity. What is traditionalist modernity? Ali Misapasi has written an interesting book where he talks about the quiet revolution. I agree in some parts, I disagree, but I do want to emphasize that we are looking at the Pahlavi modernization as something very complex and thanks to this dude, Peter Lambert Wilson, does anyone know him as an anarchist poet? Uh, he was based in Iran. He was actually in the Iran's Academy for Philosophy. What's the, I forget, I have to, I have to remember the, recall the exact title, where Sayyid Nash actually had, and Nash actually invited him to come and translate and do some translation works. So he was in Iran, he was based, he was also working with um, Henry Corbin. And of course, for those who know, Henry Corman is very much working still with the Gobinian idea of Shia Islam somehow inheriting some kind of a distinct religion of itself, uh, distinct from the Sunni Islam. And he also connected to Christianity. But hold on. What I'm trying to say is that this guy made a fascinating argument in this 1976 article. I urge you to read it. He's comparing, so he's observing Tehran during this time. And he's saying that there's actually a tension in Iran between two forms of modernism. One is the Mohandasi or engineering type, the one that wants to technocratically build Iran, the way Shah did. Shah was fascinated by that. And he also, the military aspect could be connected to the engineering, given the fact that military is so much tied to engineering technology. But then there is a mystical modernism that he noticed, and he thought it was actually a good thing, given the fact Iran has a deep roots in Sufism, and that he acknowledges Farah for on, you know, advancing it. I think he's right. And in fact, the genesis of the Shiraz Art Festival go back to the way in which Farah saw this fascinating uh, festival in Nancy, France, and he thought we should bring that to Iran as a way of reviving Iranian modernity, making sure Iran is not being destroyed under the machine of technology or machine industrialization. Uh, really quickly, these slides I need to show everyone. Uh, it's just fascinating. Um, this festival is huge. To this day, it fascinates me and many people because it did a bunch of things. It did reinvent or revive a number of traditions. These are the more, quote unquote, classical traditions. Music was very much part of this. Um, there was the whole idea of meeting of the West and East. A lot of self-orientalized or orientalized categories and conceptualization. A fascinating modern ex uh, experimental modernist genre is developing here. Um, this is my favorite. This, is, this was subversive, by the way. Mijana Mufid's Shahra Qasseh was subversive. This one, Siyavash Tar Takht Jamshid by Rahnama, is fascinating. I, I think the politics are different, in my opinion. I know people won't disagree with me. Bunch of experimental things are happening. The way Iran, quote unquote, is fused with the West and ballet and Saadi. Um, of course, there were controversies, a lot of nudity. Oh my God, of course, this, this just make the, the whole festival so controversial. There was also a, a, a ritual sacrifice of a rooster. And that's a thing that really bothers me. But anyway, it did happen with, a, with a, a, a ritual dance that came from Brazil that created headlines. But of course, the most controversial in the Sonati part was Tazia. Oh gosh, I ran out of time, didn't I? There a, do you think I could have like two or three minutes to talk about this? Is that okay? Just really very quickly, two and a half minutes. Uh, the controversy, is that, controversy was that how do we actually stage Tazia? And Afari, Nasr uh, were very much advocate of putting Tazia in the festivals. No, we should not have it banned. And of course, Bahram Beizai, who also very much thought we should do it, they were the people behind uh, staging Tazia. Uh, the other question, whether we should actually stage a theater, of course, Peter Brook 
was against it. And there was, and I'm going to end it here. There's so much more I want to show you, but maybe if there's time. Peter Brook, just to give you an idea, got into apparently an argument with our good friend, Parvin Sayyad. And he said, uh uh, I've seen Tazia, and it's a it's a, it's a spontaneous performance. I saw it in the village. This is completely staged, and he was right. In fact, Pavi Sayyad's version of Tazieh actually made it into a theatrical form of dialogues, which you're not supposed to do. He also did something else. He would tell the Tazieh Khan and the, the performers to go to certain places and go, you don't do that in Tazieh. Tazieh is spontaneous, just like the way I'm right now breaking away from my own, doing other goodies of my own um, a narrative here. There's a lot of imp improvised elements to Tazia. And Peter Brook was pissed. Now, don't get me wrong, one should be pissed off Peter Brook as well, the late Peter Brook, I should not disrespect him, because he was very much looking at the Orient in order to revive Western theater. So one could also criticize Peter Brook. But nevertheless, that debate continued to 1971, and that's why there was an interruption. That's why for five years, Tazia was not uh, um, you know, stage. And then when it was stage, it was done in a way that looked authentic, and it was done in a Hosseinia. In fact, already in 1971, it was done in a Hosseinia to make it more authentic. But in reality, we are really saw the beginnings of theatricalization of Tazia, which are ties to really the Aryan race theory conception originally endorsed by Gobineau. I'm so sorry for going over the time. I know we have some time for Q&A. I want to thank you for listening to me. I do apologize if I bored you, but nevertheless, I think we are looking forward to an interesting Q&A session. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's, that's the point, right? To do talk about controversy. Who are we supposed to sacrifice now? <laughs> as long as there are no roosters involved. <laughs> hi, Paul Maxwell. Yes, hi. hi. Um, I, uh, I was really fascinated by your talk, especially because I think a lot about how um, Tazia and then also Siyad Wadi Bash's theater are both presented as this sort of indigenous theater. Um, and that's uh, like a conscious thing to talk about in that way. But Those are the best questions. But I've seen, um, I've seen images from Tazi performances in Iran where people are dressed almost like Jin. And I've oh. seen that from Blackface. Is that something that emerges in the Pahlavi era? Do we have, like, uh, or is it a post revolutionary thing? Or Can I ask which pictures, uh, wh what historical period were these pictures? Like recent, very recent. Recent. Yeah. Look, um, actually, the Siawazi. Um, it's possible. I have seen, so Takya Dolat, this is the Nasser period, where we see a lot of masking and a lot of elaborate performances of Tazia, even the comical side of it. Okay? We said a lot. We know that. How about Siawazi? I actually don't know. It would be very interesting to look into, because now we have to understand how the, the, the slave industry or in, in 19th century is being connected to the Nasser economy of, of Tazia being involved with that as well, Takya economy. I don't know, actually, but that's an excellent question. If we are seeing it now, shame on those people. So I'm going to say this explicitly. Given the fact Siobhuzi is explicitly a performance of, OK, I'm going to stop there. But you get my point. Um, it, but the historical period, 19th century, it, makes, it would make a lot of sense if it was incorporated. And, and we have, just have to look at the Golestan Palace and, and to see what kind of stuff they have there. There are still things that are being discovered and things being stolen, apparently. But, but that's, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much for bringing that up. There are many people that, my understanding, and I had a discussion with uh, Oven Asian, uh, that he, he was, of course, there in the festivals. He was inspired by Tazia, of course. We know that. But uh, his, and of course, we have his picture here. But it was really Peter Brook that overshadowed the whole Tazia discussion. So that's my understanding. But as far as him being, and this is the cool thing about a performance like Tazia, and it could relate it to all forms of, 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 of ritual performances that it could be flexibly taken in different ways and, and Grotowski did that. He did a really interesting, fascinating job. There were these, these experimental theater uh, directors, they were fascinated by the idea of the spontaneous. 
And this is not unique to this decade, given the fact we could go back to the Romantic era, where the spontaneous was very much in the mind of everyone. All of this, basically, we're seeing another wave of, again, artists, intellectuals, who are trying to somehow counter this whole metaphor of the machine. And the metaphor of the machine existed from 19th century, when Michelet brought it up, all the way to this time. It's in the mind. Ala Ahmad's book is all about the machine. And, and Al Ahmad should be also understood and connected to the theater culture of the time. Ahmad uh, Forsis Goldun is also understood to be a, a counter a play against the machine. So all of these people have that in their mind as they're doing the writing, the performance. In fact, one picture I have. Um, this, this was also done by Brooke in a way of using Persopolis as a background in order to bring out the spontaneous and the ancient. The ancient was understood to be a site of rediscovery, authenticity. I don't call it nativism, by the way. But I do think it was really the search for the authentic. But thank you for that question. It's a fascinating character. Oh. The reorganization of the human sensorium, you have this idea at the end about engineering as one form of divinity and the physical divinity as another. It seemed to me that it was kind of mapping on to the oracular as the sort of yeah. loci of, under, of, of um, perception and, yeah. and, 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 and the ear. But the thing is, is that, so, so you're getting into these debates then about like these, these places being de uh, de uh, provincialized in Europe or uh, around like history one and history two, that kind of stuff. And so uh, I'm going to sort of cheat and bring yeah. in like an argument I've made. Sure, as please. A, as like a, an article in theory in a fan called <laughs> Things Unheard. You should read this stuff, but anyway, it was really good. This, uh, there is this like passage in Power Strategy that you just brought up that's really interesting where Al Ahmad talks about how the state is filling the eyes, ears, and minds. And that's right. There you go. And there's this comparison that you can basically he revises it in 63, or in 64, arguably after the July riots, and where he says that he introduces character called the tired young worker who sings at night when he's walking home from the factory and fills his own ears. He produces his own silence. What's interesting there is that there's this kind of nostalgia for um, a silence that is that is that a, a vague conceptual and digital grasp by the state, right? And my, you know, when I'm thinking of these two modernities, one of the questions is, is like, what what's the, is there a nostalgia yeah. or an organization of the human sensorium that's actually impossible to um, and and I guess one of an interesting note, like a like trivia that you probably already know, but like one of the guests or performers at the GOS festival is John Cage. Yes, so uh, I have a picture of him. Yes, yes. Yeah, and so and you know I'm think, I don't think he performed his famous 4:33 or however long it is. But there, you know, this, you know, like there is no such thing as silence. There's always something that makes a sound. But there is a kind of mystical a mystical apprehension or revelry in the idea of a universal yeah. silence. Yeah, and I wonder yeah. if what we're seeing here oh, is, fantastic. Is, a, is a multiplicity of silences, a plurality of different experiences. Th there's a longing, there's a quest for it. I also think, following Marx's famous um, reference in his 1848 manuscript, that there's a working and a labor of the senses, mm -hmm. especially with regards to the way in which the Pahlavi is just like. <laughs> Just like the other aesthetic politics of the 1920s and 30s rely on the visual and the sight, the fascist movements, especially in, in German Italy, uh, the Pahlavis are also relying on specific practice of visuality. So I'm personally, I very much believe in the idea of intersensoriality, uh, given the fact that we are all operating with our senses that go beyond the five senses, by the way. But what's specifically happening, especially in 19, with the futures, the rise of futurism, as a, a, a political social movements which helped fascism and then other movements is that there's an overemphasis on the eye and the sight, uh, but the very distinct kind of understanding of a sight, a sight that has to be made into a spectacle, visualized, displayed, exhibited. And you know, one could think about uh, Marshall uh, Berman, if I'm not mistaken, his last name, who, who talked about this in, with the rise of the Crystal Palace and exhibition and, 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 and world expos. And in fact, he also made reference to Shiraz Festival. He ta ta talked about it as a spectacle of modernism. He actually made reference to John Cage in his book. Uh, so that's a very interesting thing. So I think that's what's going on also in, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And in fact, you could go to 1984 book of, of Berman, is that there is this, 
this, this threat and, and the tyranny of, of visual as a spectacle. And there is a search for silence. And no wonder Sufism and the hippie movement, the counterculture was fascinated by the idea of silence. Buddhism was fascinating because of its reliance on the idea of silence. And, and, and so I could talk about, let's talk about this later. But, but, but the point I'm trying to make here is that this particular uh, moment, there's a reaction to that specific kind of visuality, not vision general, but specific visuality that has to do with the commodi commodification of vision, which in my opinion, actually the Shiraz Art Festival is very much participating in. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about, we'll have, uh, I'm gonna be silent now. Yes, moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent it, question. It exactly yeah. the Persian nationalistic side of it. And if that is the case, if there wasn't any performative changes in, in the actual uh, ideas, can we, say, can we then say it wasn't necessarily being Aryanized for their Western eyes, but perhaps that's what the audiences were responding to. That's what was captivating the audience, whether the claps were louder, the yeah, claps sure. grew larger. Maybe that's what was happening. It's a bad place to look for uh, for information, oh, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Sure, sure. That already happened with Taki Dolat, by the way, the incorporation of various different kind of modern technologies, including photography, and that that's something interesting to see. But I, I love your question because I want to distinguish the first generation post-constitutional uh, intellectuals. Um, they are intellectualizing Aryanization, but they're doing it through folklore villages, but they're not looking at Islam, right? The second generation, especially the Khojas and Pakistan, they are actually trying to performatively display it. How are they doing it? How are we seeing Tazi being Aryanized? Well, one could say visualization, but that's not the only thing. It's the actual staging. It's the actual idea of making Tazi into a theater, which could be staged. In fact, the, word, the very fact that uh, uh, Saku was even understood as a stage itself was part of the whole ideology of uh, Aryanization, because Aryanization ultimately saw theater as the ultimate expression of Aryan civilization. This is how not just Gobina, but also other Aryan theorists were understanding theory. And that's why they thought Islam doesn't have theater. Islam doesn't have theory because it's not sophisticated. It's a Semitic religion which is really bogus given the fact we know theater comes in so many complicated variations from 19th century onwards. And in fact, the experimentals were trying to do that. But there was this very weird conception with Pavi Sayyad's notion of theater that had to do with this idea of a staging, a place you go up and then there's a stage that people are looking at. And now we're going to show the Westerners ourselves how really beautifully Aryan we are. Or the word, of course, the word that is constantly used in Islam is not Aryan, but is Irani, of course. Um, a lot of implicit language is not very explicit. So that's why it was so difficult for me to disentangle all these different pieces. But that's how it was done. The theatricalization itself was an Aryan, Aryanization act. That's my opinion. But thank you. That was an excellent question. Thank you. Yes. Because they were, they had this 
you know, uh, off down the road. You see, I think somewhat a misunderstanding mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what they intended to do. Mm -hmm. They were looking at, to them, theater was either tragedy or comedy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they were looking to see what had they inherited from what, again, they considered theater, yeah. right? And they found or discovered this great, um, you want to call it doko, you want to call it religious, mm -hmm. you want to call mm -hmm. it um, whatever you want to call it, but they called it indigenous, mm -hmm. not in a way to put it down, but mm -hmm. in a way to distinguish it from what of was course. called of Roman. Course. And, uh, and Can I ask you why an attempt to distinguish it from the Greco-Roman tradition? Why? I think because that's what they knew. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Really, that's what they that's do. That's a good I mean, point. When you, yeah. when you read mm -hmm. their text, it's yeah. not at all. They begin by saying comedy does not exist in the world of Islam, mm -hmm. which is an absolute misunderstanding mm -hmm. of what mm -hmm. comedy is, mm -hmm. and it's a gross generalization. And the so-called world of Islam, yeah. Yes, and it did yeah. actually exist, but they define comedy mm -hmm. as, uh, as a something with a plot and with acts mm -hmm. and with, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. That's what their mm -hmm. definition of comedy mm -hmm. is. On the other hand, this mentality that they had about comedy did not yeah. at all yeah. apply to, mm -hmm. to tragedy. I actually, personally, I don't have much issues with the term indigenous that is being used by many of these scholars in that time. I actually don't. My issue is mostly with the reference that this is purely an Iranian tradition of performance. That's where I start seeing the Aryanization. So I agree with you. I think the, the, the also in their part, the attempt was to understand this idea of a boomy farhang, this indigenous farhang. I don't use the word native because it has different connotations. Uh, so I actually like that part to a certain point. You know, it could potentially have the same cultural essentialist connotations, but I don't think in this case they were doing that. So I agree with you. However, I do think that when you're making a reference to Tazia being a purely Iranian manifestation, it begs so many assumptions. It also assumes that people of Iran are performing Tazia on a wild. No, that's not true. That's not true. Tazia is very geographically specific. There are parts of Iran that Tazia is not practiced at all. I just mentioned Kurdistan purposely as an example. And to call it a national heritage itself is a construct, is an innovation. And so that's the part that I was trying. But you're right. I, I, I think that that's why if you notice in my talk, I did not even bring up the, the issue of indigenous, uh, which in itself some people in theater studies, I know they have issues with it. Uh, but I'm somewhat OK with it. Um, yeah. yeah. And by the way, just because we're talking about in indigenous in response to Deepa's question about the masks yeah. and the um, blackening of faces, as far as I have found, that stuff did exist yeah. in the Bajar period. Yeah. Or oh, Siyah Bazi in, in Takie or Tazie no, or? No, no, no. In, uh, the blackening of faces mm -hmm. that sometimes happens with the color black and mm -hmm. sometimes happens with the color white. Yeah. And to this day, different regions of Iran have different colors and they represent Lashkar uh, mm -hmm. uh led by Jafar Demi, but I don't know if people are still in the room, so I can talk to them about that. But this is. You know, this, this did exist in the Bajar period. It did, and, and, and the idea of blackening your face had different manifestations, different traditions. And Siyah is, is a distinct one. In my opinion, it had its own history, but, but I agree with you. And for those who are interested in the mask tradition in uh, Taziyad, um, that one of the books I mentioned, it actually has a bunch of pictures from Golestan Palace that they have actually produced in that book. It's fascinating. The masking culture of Taziyad is just fascinating. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful question. That was excellent. Have the last question, Michael. Oh, it's not a question. It's just uh, a proposal. Does anyone want to submit the Tazia outside? Oh, yes. That's, and yeah, sorry. So why, yeah, so <laughs> it's also Mr. Bedeckham and the other people. That's Absolutely. About. Just, you, just when you mentioned this idea of rural, not rural, it's not urban, whatever, well, what about a traveling market? Is that a way? Is that a place? Also, oh, uh, you're, you're talking about. Um, Indigenous Tazia being performed outside of Iran, or are you talking about? Oh, I see what you're saying. Actually, the idea was, according to my research, it shows uh, Furughi brought this up to um, Brown, and he thought that uh, uh, perhaps Tazia is a, has a Christian root to it. Is that what you meant? Uh, oh, okay. Oh, other look, it's it's. I'm coming from a school of thought that I don't see culture as locked up. It's constantly being. That's why the word indigenous for me is very fluid. You know, it's 
coming from various directions and how creatively a community picks it up and reinvents or invents something, I do believe that. So I, we don't know. That's the problem with Tazia. We don't know exactly the 40 years from 1704, the last accounts, till, well, actually longer than 40 years, we actually don't know where, exactly where Tazia emerged and how it was done. It was definitely a communal effort. We know that. It's a community event. Tazia is community. That's why you, it's so difficult to bring it up at stage, you know? So, but which community, which regions exactly? My theory is that it's coming from the south of Iran. That's my theory uh, in the Zan period. And, it's, and Nader Shah was not able to eradicate it either. So. Thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, come back again. Thank you so much. Thank you.